Good morning. It's great to see you all this lovely, slightly wet Sunday morning. I'm excited to worship with you. As we find our seats and prepare for worship, let's turn to page 64 in your hymnals and sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
seated. Just a few announcements for you this morning. They're on the back of the bulletin, but this Wednesday is a very important day. Two holidays in one. It's not often we get to celebrate two occasions on one day. So we have Valentine's Day. So if you've not gotten your significant other a gift, I suggest you do some quick shopping. But we also celebrate the High Holy Day of Ash Wednesday. We kick off the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday. It's one of my favorite services of the year. So I'd encourage you to join us at 6 p.m. for a very quick service. And then you can go on your Valentine's Day date and enjoy the secular holiday on the same night. During the day, if you can't come at 6 p.m., I will be holding office hours. I will be here the vast majority of the day sitting in Chuck's office, which is to my left, your right. So you can come in this side door and find me sitting there. It won't be Pastor Chuck because he's still on his cruise. It'll be me, but please join me if you can't make it at 6 p.m. Otherwise, I'll be bored all day sitting there alone. Um, I'll, the times will be sent out in the newsletter. I have an appointment at 1, a meeting, um, a counseling session, so I'll step out from 1 to 3 um, and then be back to impose ashes on anyone who would like to come. The Sardis Women's Circle will meet Tuesday, right, Pam? I see it on here. Tuesday the 13th, so... Oh, at Sarah's house. Okay. It's good for me to know. Every time you hold it, I show up and they're here. And I'm like, oh, wow. I didn't know you were coming this week. You will not be here on Tuesday. So at Sarah's house. So get the address from Pam if you'd like to join the Sardis Women's Circle. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather in your name. We gather as your children. Lord, with gratitude in our hearts. Lord, we have gratitude for what your son did for us on Calvary. Lord, we have gratitude for how we watch you work in our lives every day of the week. Lord, we come with this thanksgiving. Lord, some of us come tired, some of us come weary. I ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that you would refresh us this week. Lord, that you'd prepare our hearts for the season of Lent. Or that it would be a time of preparation to celebrate once again your resurrection. To relive the story of your death and resurrection. And to receive anew the grace that saved us from our sin. Lord, I ask that you would prepare us for worship. That we would fill your Holy Spirit amongst us. In your holy name I pray.
please join me on page 881 as we affirm our faith before God and one another. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I invite you to pray with me. Lord, we come to you. And in this hour, we lift up the suffering in this world. Lord, all of us have seen suffering this week in some form. And so, Lord, to you, we lift up the darkness. Lord, we lift up to you our friends, our family, those amongst us who grieve this morning. Lord, who have lost loved ones, whether recently or many, many years ago. Lord, we ask that we would feel your comforting hand. Lord, that you would extend your healing presence into this world. Lord, that you would give us eyes to see the light that shines from heaven all across this world. Lord, that you would give us the wisdom to recognize the everyday miracles, how we see your Holy Spirit working in the world around us. We ask that you would bless this time of worship. As we open up the gospel, may we encounter you in a new and fresh way. Lord, may we come into your presence in a new way, and may we be sanctified by your presence. In your presence, may we come to look like you. May we come to reflect your light into this world. May we come to be your ambassadors in this world. It's your holy name I pray. Amen. Scripture for this morning is from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. And this is a very crucial story in the Gospels. We call it the Transfiguration, and it's so important that we have a high holy day every single year to retell this story amongst our family. So hear the word now. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. And suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Word of God for the people of God. All right, let's sing and worship together. They're in a congregational favorites. Who's got a hymn they would like to sing the first verse? All right, we'll do five. We'll do five, sing five first, and then I'll worship the Lord. I haven't been ready for the last few times. I haven't been ready. All right, fine. 
هم داریم با هم
Margaret the Crow. Say what? Every year on Transfiguration Sunday, I find that something has bugged me, and I haven't quite been able to figure out what it was. I've been a Methodist my entire life, 28 years. I've been preaching for four years, and every Transfiguration Sunday, something has bugged me. And this year, I figured it out. Crawford, who's in the back in the blue polo, if you don't know, we were talking on Thursday morning. And I figured it out. I was telling him it's Transfiguration Sunday. It's a high holy day. I love high holy days. They're pretty easy to preach because the stories are the same every year. right? So you can recycle a little bit. And then he asked, what does transfigured mean? And I realized the one word has bugged me every year because I didn't actually know what the word transfigured means. Then the name of the day, and no one had exactly taught me for 28 years, for four years of preaching, I hadn't looked it up, what the word transfigured means. And I found out this week, in the last couple days, that the scriptures show us the meaning of the word transfigured. And what we learn is a profound truth about the gospel and about our lives. You see, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up a high mountain. Peter, James, and John are Jesus' inner circle. If you didn't know that, Jesus is often seen pulling Peter, James, and John away from the twelve to teach them something, to show them an incredible experience. When he goes to the house of Jairus to heal his daughter, Peter, James, and John are the only disciples who go with him. They go up a high mountain, and the scripture says that Jesus is transfigured. And there's the word. And Mark doesn't just tell us this is what it means. We have to keep reading. His clothes become dazzling white, such as no one one on earth could bleach them. Right there, before their own eyes. Jesus begins to glow, to emit a radiant, brilliant light light from his being. And I'll ask Mark if he means it literally, because my grandmother can bleach stuff pretty white. She can always get the stain out. But that is how Mark describes the image of Christ, a radiant white, so white that no one on earth could bleach him. The seasons of Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany in which we end today all use this imagery of light to help us conceptualize the coming of Jesus Christ. John tells us that Jesus comes as the light 
of the world and that this light has shone into the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And right before Peter, James, and John, up on a high mountaintop, Jesus is transfigured visually into this light. The light of heaven, which is his very essence, radiates from his being. Transfigured. It means to change form. The word is metamorpho, right? Which, Perry and Hinton, you're here today. I don't know if this would click, but I think of the mighty Morphin Power Rangers. They change form into the Power Rangers when danger comes to save the world. Superman spins around and changes into a Superman costume and he's no longer Clark Kent. It's to transform, to totally change form. And for just a moment, these three disciples gaze upon the heavenly form of Jesus. His splendor, his majesty radiates as light from his being. Mark shows us that heaven and earth collided on that mountain. We tend to think of heaven and earth as separate locations. This is how we think about the world, right? Today we're at Sardis Methodist Church. This is where we are. It's not Peachtree Presbyterian Church. That's a different geographic location, right? We are here in Buckhead. We're not in Marietta. We're not in Sandy Springs. This is where we are. But heaven and earth don't actually function that way. They're described as spaces, as realms. God in Genesis creates the heavens and creates the earth and he fills them. And occasionally, they collide. In Genesis, they're perfectly overlapped. Adam and Eve walk in the garden. We just sang the song, right? In the garden. They walk in the garden in perfect communion. Heaven and earth are the same place. And then by the fall of man, they're ripped apart. But right here on the Mount of Transfiguration, for just a moment, they overlap. And we see this because Moses and Elijah appear before them. And a cloud settles around them. And from the cloud, the voice of God the Father declares, This is my Son, whom I love. Listen to him. For just a second, Peter, James, and John are in heaven. With Jesus. They see his radiant light flowing from him. They see Moses and Elijah, the two great patriarchs, and they hear the voice of God the Father. But what I want us to look at today is what happens next. What exactly happens to Peter, James, and John when they leave the mountain with Jesus? We know what happens to Jesus. Right from this mountain. Mark quickly takes the story to Palm Sunday. This is Mark 9. Mark 11 is Palm Sunday. Jesus has his triumphant entry, and that begins Holy Week. And then he is arrested. Jesus is tortured. Jesus is hung on the cross where he dies the worst possible imaginable death for us on the cross. And then three days later, praise the Lord, Jesus raises from the dead. We know this story. It is the basis of our faith. But look at what happens to Peter, James, and John. Just a few days later, they are betrayed by their friend. They experience the trauma of watching Jesus, their master, arrested right before their eyes, unable to do anything about it. And then they witness the trauma of Jesus' crucifixion, their master dying agonizing death. John is the only disciple that sees it firsthand. We see that John stands with Jesus' mother Mary as she watches her son die. And then they hide. Peter, James, and John fear for their lives for three days. Afraid that they will be next. That just because they follow Jesus, they would be crucified next. They hide in fear. And then they experience the unimaginable joy of Jesus' resurrection. I love the way John tells it. 
he tells of Mary Magdalene, the first person to proclaim, to preach the resurrection, running to the disciples and telling them that he is no longer in the grave, that someone has taken the master and that she has seen him. And John tells us that the disciple whom Jesus loved and Peter run to the tomb, but the disciple who Jesus loved arrived first. It's kind of petty because that's John, right? He chose to record for all of history that he was faster than Peter. It's kind of two brothers fighting, right? It's kind of funny, but they experience this unimaginable joy of the resurrection. And then a few days later, They watch Jesus leave right before their very eyes. They watch the heavens open up and the angels carry Jesus into heaven. And then you see the roller coaster. Jesus dies. He comes back. This emotional roller coaster that Peter, James and John are riding. And then on the day of Pentecost, everything changes. They receive the Holy Spirit as fire from heaven and they are emboldened to preach the gospel. And in the book of Acts, we start to see that these disciples begin to look a lot like Jesus, a lot like their master. In Acts chapter 3, Peter, James, and John are walking to the temple on a normal day And Peter sees a lame beggar begging for some money. And he tells the beggar, silver or gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give it to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Walk. Just like their master, they heal the lame beggar. They pull him up from his mat and he begins to walk. And the very next day, Peter Peter and John are taken before the highest court in the land, the Sanhedrin, and questioned just like their master. But what I want you to listen to is how Ananias, the high priest, the very same man who turned Jesus over to the Roman authorities, concludes in Acts 14, chapter I mean, Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Ananias states, it says that when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. Ananias was astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Ordinary men transformed for the simple reason that they had been with Jesus. Being with Jesus changed Peter and John so remarkably that the enemies of Jesus were forced to take note. That the enemies that turned Jesus over to crucifixion, that the same men that would continue to persecute the church for hundreds of years, had to take note that these men had been entirely transformed by just being with Jesus. And it only gets more remarkable. Read through the book of Acts. You will see that at the hands of the disciples, Miracles are performed. Listen to these two passages. The first is from Mark chapter 6, verse 56. Mark writes, And whenever Jesus went into villages, towns, or countrysides, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. And now in Acts 5, 15, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Peter looks an awfully lot like Jesus. Perhaps we could even say that Peter 
has been transfigured. His entire being has been transformed. And friends, this was where we find the gospel message, the truth of the gospel. Because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, he has made a way for us to enter heavenly spaces right here, right now, to be transformed. Through Jesus Christ, we receive a new identity. We are no longer ours, but his. We are no longer what we used to be, fallen sinners. We become children of God, his ambassadors, his embodiment, his presence in this world. So I ask you today a very, very important question. Have you been with Jesus? In John 15, Jesus commands us to abide in him. The call of Christ is to take up our cross and to follow him every single day. We like to reduce this verse to any effort or struggling that could possibly be perceived as struggling for Christ. We say, oh, that's my cross to bear. But Christ is literally calling us. He is calling the world to die every single day so that Christ can live in and through us. Paul writes that we must be crucified with Christ. So that it is no longer we who live, but Christ. So I ask you today, do you abide in Christ every single day, such as you have been crucified with Christ? Christ demands nothing less. And secondly, I ask you, do people notice? As you go about your life, as you live in this dark world, do people see the light of Christ? Like Ananias, do they take notes that you have been with Jesus? Do people notice that you have been with Jesus? And friends, what happens next to Peter, James, and John is devastating. They continue to do the work of Christ. Despite the threat of death, Peter, James, and John cannot help but declare the love they have for their master. They stand before court after court, imprisonment after imprisonment, and they consistently declare the gospel of Jesus Christ in the presence of their certain death. They consistently declare the gospel. Every single disciple except John We'll talk about John. Every single disciple except John is martyred, killed, gruesome death because they have been with Jesus. John goes on to die of old age. He's known later in life as John the Elder. He's known for a good period as John the Beloved. And then as he ages, he's known as John the Elder. But John did not have a glamorous life. He is arrested multiple times. He is tortured for his faith multiple times. And eventually, he is exiled to live on an island all alone. The island of Patmos. Where he died in exile. The scriptures make it clear. A disciple becomes like their master. This is the entire point of our faith, to be a disciple of Jesus. Therefore, if you claim this morning to be a Christian, I leave you with the question, have you been transfigured? And are you being transfigured? Friends, when we come to Christ, we receive new identity. We are transfigured into sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. And as we walk each step with Jesus, we are continuously transformed every single day, becoming just a little bit more like our master. Are you more like Jesus than you were yesterday? Are you more like Jesus than you were a year ago? Are you more like Jesus than 10 years ago? 
you more like Jesus than 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. I want you to think back to when you gave your life to Christ. Are you more like Jesus today than when you first called him your Lord and Master? And if not, why? Amen. Please join me on page 395. Take time to be holy. 